Oh, it worked. Hey. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep, yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. It kind of zoomed in on my face. Yeah, Hold me up. too. <laughs> A little uncomfortable. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. I've gone Instagram live solo, but I've never done it with another person. I'm like honored. Someone. I'm honored to be your first. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Hello. Hey, so let's just give it like a minute or two. Let some people sure. join. Um, but I appreciate you being on time. Um, I know you're a very busy man and you must be busier than ever these days. So thanks for being here. I was just playing. I was just not doing anything. <laughs> were you saying you were about, were you playing something or? No, I was watching, um, uh, the, the Mari vid, uh, videos of this lady with the olives. I just re uh, posted it. Okay. You know, weird stuff that you find on Instagram stories. <laughs> it, it is addicting for sure. They know That's exactly what you like. Okay, cool. Let's see. So you're using your phone right now? Is this how this works? I am using my phone, yes. Oh, okay. I have my uh, my phone on a shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> it works. I don't know. Yeah. Just gonna hope it don't fall. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so um, why don't we just get started? Um, I'm gonna do a brief introduction if that's okay. Yep. All right, so my name is Hang Guo. I am the co-president of Philly Solidarity. I am a psychiatrist by training. Um, I actually happen to take care of a lot of veterans. So this, this situation was very um, concerning to me from multiple levels. Um, but uh, today we're honored to be joined by Sarun Chan. He is the executive director of the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just, I like to start off by giving people their flowers. And I just wanted to say that um, during my 18 years I've lived in Philadelphia, the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia has been one of the most impressive, if not the most impressive community organization in Philadelphia. Um, the things that you do for the community are, um, I, um, I'm trying to find the right word, but I can't find it, but I just wanna say thank you. Um, ranging from, you know, the, the social services, the education services, to the health services, um, the youth programs, the programs for the elderly, the, your intergenerational projects. Um, it's, it's, it's a model of excellence, and I think it speaks to um, the strength and the bravery and the community that you guys have. Um, I can't imagine um, how challenging it must be to be the leader. Um, of the community that comes from so much trauma. Um, so before we get started on the, the heavy stuff, can you just tell us a little bit about how you came into this position? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll try to be fast. Um, I, I don't think anyone wants to hear about the long stories. <laughs> so I first, um, I was 24 years old and I just left Penn State and I was looking for a job. And, uh, you know, initially this, the, it started was, um, I was in my freshman year at Penn State University main campus, and I never really reflected on my background, my my my, my journey as a Cambodian American, uh, Asian American. I've always felt alienated in the sense that I went to um, I went to an all arts high school, Kappa High School here in Philadelphia, and I was the only Asian American that graduated. Uh, we had three Asians total; all three were Cambodian American, but uh, unfortunately, I was the only one that graduated that year. Uh, but as I made my way to middle of nowhere state college you know it's very white there you know it made you really really reflect on your your, your identity and things like that uh joined the um, cambodian uh, group that was there um and I, my very first job in nonprofit was with migrant education which is this amazing organization that works with migrant children migrant families and i was at a, at, at home teacher i was just this 18 year old going to people's houses meeting them newly arrived immigrants uh most of them were cambodian and I was really inspired. So I got bit by the nonprofit bug very early uh, at 18 years old, and I kept at it. Um, when I returned here to back to Philadelphia, 
uh, I saw a job opening at the Cambodian Association. Uh, I didn't get the position I applied for, uh, but they liked me a lot. So they <laughs> they offered me something else, um, a seasonal position working with youth. Uh, and from working with youth, fast forward, all these other random stuff that has happened, great things has happened, um, working with youth, community, elders, all the generations you could think of. Uh, and that's the best part about the Cambodian Association. We work with every single age group, every single generation. Um, and it, it's just been an amazing experience. Uh, for the last decade working with that specific organization. I did leave for a little moment. Uh, and then when the position was open for the new ED, uh, I wasn't planning on applying. I was working in environmental conservation with the Alliance for Watershed Education uh, for about two, two and a half to three years. And I loved it. Um, and I, I was still volunteering at the Cambodian Association and doing things for my community. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of push uh, for me to apply from the community and other community leaders uh, wanting me to return, and I made the decision to put a little proposal in. If I do return, these are some things that have parameters, uh, and that's where I end up back here. So I've been the ED for close to almost um, once September hits. It'll be three years as the director of the association. Um, and something a lot of people don't know, the association is actually a membership organization, uh, and that's how it was founded. It's a membership organization. Majority of the members are elderly refugees that founded the organization, and they vote for the president, things like that. So, but yeah, that's trying to make it short, and <laughs> that's how I ended back at the association. And I joke, and I said that they trapped me. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> and now they're stuck with you. Um, no, I kid. They're, they're very <laughs> lucky to have you, you know, just in our brief interactions, witnessing your leadership from afar. It's just been so impressive. And um, I think your leadership in the association's organizational excellence is something that um, we are going to try to model and learn from. Um, you guys are really paving the way. I know a lot of times uh, Southeast Asians um, are not the first people, uh, the first ethnic group that people think about when they think about mm. quote unquote Asian excellence. Um, mm. And that's certainly something that we need to address. But I want to say for me personally, I mm. think you guys are excellent and uh, I have a lot to learn from you guys. Um, mm. So, um, you know, we're here today because we want to talk about how the community is doing following um, the ethnic intimidation that happened. There was a lot of press leading up to the press conference. It's been kind of quiet since. And I was wondering what kind of updates you wanted to share about the community or what's been going on. Sure. Yeah. Like it's been a whirlwind, right? A tornado. And it's only been two and a half weeks almost. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I could go into a quick spiel for anyone who wasn't following. Uh, about two weeks ago, July 5th, right after the third of July 4th weekend, our association received a letter and we opened it and it was a very threatening violent specific letter targeting the Cambodian community of South Philadelphia for shooting fireworks. Uh, and in the letter itself, it was an individual that self-identified as a war vet, self-identified as someone who suffers from PTSD, self-identified as someone who has a lot of guns, self-identified as someone who will use them to kill Cambodian community members if they do not stop shooting fireworks. Again, this was received July 4th weekend. Um, and just to note, I want to also emphasize that it's around the Mifflin Square Park area. And those of you who know Philadelphia as a whole, and also South Philly, and also Mifflin Square Park, it's not just Cambodians that are playing with fireworks. Let's get real. All ethnic groups, all nationalities are shooting up fireworks everywhere and anywhere. Uh, so that's why for us as an organization, for myself, you know, it's targeted. Uh, it's ethnic intimidation. Uh, it's a real term that's used. Uh, you can look it up. Um, it, it's, it, it goes along the lines of a hate crime towards a hate crime. Uh, and it, it's, it's uncalled for, for sure. Um, but pretty much the whirlwind of uh, calling the police officers, investigators, uh, the police department, they did work. They worked uh, fairly quickly and they were able to identify the individual. Uh, the individual was soon identified as a 79 year old woman who lived in the area who was supposedly sick of the fireworks, right? But here's the thing. It doesn't matter her age or her gender. You know what I mean? Um, they did try to play it off as if it was okay now. But the thing is, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you threaten an entire community, you know, you have to be accountable. And the other question is, just because you identified a person, that doesn't mean the investigation's over. Is this person working alone? Do they have family with guns? 
the letter we received was typed, right? It was conscious. Uh, they, it was in an envelope that was mailed to the post office without a return address, you know. And they also, I felt, I forgot to share. They said that for the C Cambodian Association, it was our responsibility to make the Cambodians stop. And if we didn't, it was our fault that they died and got killed, right? So to put the blame and shift the blame on our organization, which is just a, a multi-service youth program, social service organization. Uh, I'm the ED, but I do not have the control of every single Cambodian in the city of Philadelphia. That's ridiculous to even think about, right? It's not our responsibility. They have their lives. We don't control anybody. Side note to that, right? But anyway, yeah, so, um, and that, that's the other thing. The investigation was not complete yet. You have to find out who they are. Are they part of any supremacist groups? Uh, what kind of Facebook groups are they part of online? Do, do, do their family members have a military background or whatnot? And, you know, a part of that, that finding is that that person self-informed the police officers that, no, that person, she was not a vet. She did not suffer from PTSD. And she did not go to Iraq and Afghanistan. And she did not have guns, right? Um, so that's the initial, just her saying it. Like, there needs to be, you know, uh, there was investigation more so later on. But fast forward to um, our community, you know, we, we, we acted fast. We informed the local neighborhood, whether they were Cambodian or not. We, we went home to home and gave them letters, right? No matter if they're Asian, white, black, no matter who. You're a, you're a target, right? No matter what, uh, uh, if you live in the area. Uh, to inform them of the situation before we figure out who it was. Um, from there, you know, we already confirmed that we wanted to host that press conference at the park, you know, and it was very important that Philly PD did share the news, right? We wanted to make sure that everyone got an update from straight from the mouth of the PD. Uh, and we had other elected officials, community leadership. Uh, and I would like to say, and I'm rambling, just the one thing I really need to say is, the Cambodian community, we're 40 years, 40 plus years in in Philadelphia, right? It's not just CAGP, the Cambodian Association. It, we, we made sure we contact all our Cambodian leadership across the city, across, across the different um, professional fields. So we had Kiths who, who, who does social services and mental health, mental behavior health with Dr. Neri Kith. We did, um, the Cambodian Business Association with Mr. Hoor, uh, Pang, and also Narin. Narin, who's also an advocate for, for, for um, you know, uh, immigration and such. Uh, we contacted Principal Poe, uh, the health, um, uh, Department, uh, the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, Department of Behavioral Health, Lanaka, who's arts advocacy, all the things you can think about, all the different various kinds. And we came together to decide what was next for our community, connect with our communities, and make sure that we plan the press conference together, how how we're pushing uh, police and uh, well, just the city as a whole, what the next steps are. And we came together with the list of four demands. Um, so that was the press conference. And um, from there, you know, uh, the community got the updates. We, we sent um, more letters uh, to our, our community and membership about that update. Um, without losing steam, we were lucky enough just last, a few days ago, last week, uh, the most recent update is that we had a private meeting with Philly's district attorney, Larry Krasner, which is a, I didn't realize it was a big deal. Sorry, Larry Krasner. I did not know it was a big deal to have a private meeting with you. Um, just because of, um, we, we know we were lucky to have Romana from the um, Mayor's Commission on Asian Pacific American um, Advisory. I'm part of that as well. And also John Chin. Uh, so John Chin's the chairperson and they both were there. So, yeah, we were able to have that private meeting as an entire community, right? The same leadership. We came back around the table, had like an, an hour and a half, two hour meeting with them. And every single person got to speak uh, from our team. Uh, and we, we laid it down that, you know, as a community, we understand that people make mistakes, but there's still accountability that needs to be had. We shared, we still shared our list of demands, no matter who the person happened to be, these demands can still be met, uh, no matter who they are. Uh, and also, you know, I know our DA, he's not, uh, he, he's pro um, not having someone who does not have a violent um, criminal record stay in jail in a sense, right? So we kind of had a feeling that um, uh, restorative practices or restorative justice might be on his mind or, or maybe an option. But he himself wanted to invest, um, make sure he get the reports from police uh, so that whether or not um, they, they as a DA would investigate later on as well or not. 
Um, but we're going to wait for follow-ups on once the investigation is done, whether it's by Philly PD and also the DA, uh, the DA's office, um, we'll see where we go next. But we did stress that we want an apology from this individual. And we also want to figure out how we can remedy this as a community, whether it's restorative justice, uh, but either way, the, the four demands needs to be, um, to be, uh, uh met some for shape or form. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely, you know, I want to get into those four demands a little bit later, but mm -hmm. you know, as, so it sounds like the investigation is still going on. Um, mm -hmm. but what, what bothered me is that after the press conference, it seemed like there were some groups or people that kind of wanted to say, all right, you know, it's all good. There's no threat, mm -hmm. nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me is really dismissive because mm -hmm. you don't speak for the community. I don't speak for the community. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my work with PTSD, I know that once the threat is triggered, once the PTSD mm -hmm. is triggered, it doesn't go away once the threat is gone. Exactly. And actually, to treat PTSD is incredibly hard. You have to access services. You have to have the privilege of time mm -hmm. and resources to access it. And we also know that Asians, Southeast Asians, and refugees don't access mental health services. So now you have a group of people that are probably triggered who are probably not getting treatment. So, you know, one of your demands is to get that treatment to the community, which I thought was very wise. But it, it just bothers me that um, some people want to just say, quote, it was a senior citizen. She was frustrated and she was scared. Um, to me, it felt like, again, people were trying to humanize the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. um, they had a bad day, that kind of thing. Now, mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I know people say things, they don't realize the impact on the community. They probably didn't intend on being dismissive to the community. But this is the type of education we need to give to our leaders and people in power. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's one of your demands too. So I'm just, your demands hit the nail right on the head. Um, so I guess right now, um, do you know charges are being pressed? Is that something that you guys are seeking or you're waiting till the investigation is over? So uh, that from our understanding, um, there's like, and to my current understanding, I'll just be clear. <laughs> I, I watch SVU, but uh, it's just a show. <laughs> But there's the, the PD side, Philly PD side, that does their investigation, and they would send recommendations of charges to the DA, right? And then the DA can accept or do further investigation on their end to see what other charges can be met. So that's where we're at. There's still that investigation of what kind of charges could or should be, be, be delivered for this incident. Um, and, yeah, and I just want to add what you just shared earlier about people speaking for the community who may not be part of the community, that's, to me, that's disrespectful, right? It's, it's really disgusting to me, right? And, and just because you got the news first before it was released, you know, you don't speak for us, right? And I think that uh, at the press conference, sharing how we really felt uh, that this person was weaponizing PTSD as a reason to murder people and also being a, a quote-unquote self-identified vet, that's disrespectful to the vet community and people with mental illness. So for those of you online or, or watching this right now, the Cambodian community are war refugees. We're, we're survivors of genocide. We're survivors of war. And our community suffers from PTSD, actually, right? So th like you shared, like we brought it up a bunch of times. Uh, Dr. Neri Kith brought it up. This is triggering, and I, as I shared earlier, these are scars within the community that we will continue to bring up years after this, right? In the DA's office, I brought that, brought that up to him. Right now, in your office, Mr. DA, the resolution of solutions, it's being built right now, and how we, we, we want to create resolution is going to be spoke about across other communities, right? How can we use this as a tool for not only, only accountability, but also what, what justice looks like or, or restorative justice looks like and also healing. How are we going to continue to heal our community? Yeah. So. No, I, I mean, those were the two words that, you know, justice and healing. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually the harder work than figuring out the perpetrator mm -hmm. or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I want to applaud you for, 
persisting and sustaining in this work. I can't imagine how much energy and emotion it takes out of you. Um, I definitely, you know, I and Police Solidarity want to help along that ongoing road because I'm sure this isn't going to be resolved and the healing isn't going to happen in a few months, right? Like this is like generational healing that you are paving the way for. Um, so I guess what would, what would healing and what would justice look like for you? But you know, this is, this is one moment in our Philly history during the pandemic, during the quote unquote era of anti-Asian hate, if that's the term we want to use. And this is the most specific and the most targeted attack, I would say, because as I shared in the press conference and with the DA was in that letter, um, and th this connects back to healing is a, a big thing, but I'll connect it somehow. Um, this letter shared the who, the what, the where, and the how they were gonna murder Cambodian people, Asian Americans. It was just a matter of when, right? And in situations, what happened in Chinatown, in Center City, in, in the subway station against the Indonesian community, the Chinese community, it was hard for them to say, was that a hate crime, right? Did, it, did, they, do, did they say X, did they do Y, did they do that, right? So it's like, it's hard to tell. But in this situation, everything was written out. All the questions were answered. And the only thing that was missing was the where. So, you know, I try to, to be mindful that, you know, with, with this whole era, this is, this is not just only a Cambodian American issue. It's also an overall community of Asian Americans across the city, across the country. And um, the healing process, I think that it, not, it, and I, I, I'm not, I, I don't find myself in a position to tell people how to heal, but I would say there are different puzzle pieces that are in place that would help other cities and other communities see how to respond, right? And what to demand for, right? So I think that for us as Cambodian Association, I did, someone brought up that we could have just threw away the letter or we could have just responded just as one organization, kept it to ourselves and just spoke out as Cambodian Association, but we didn't. So I think part of the healing was making sure that my healing was not to have the burden of representing an entire community. I reached out and made sure we reached out to other Cambodian leadership because one mind is, uh, multiple minds are better than one and we need multiple voices. So part of that healing process was knowing that you're not alone in this situation, right? My mental health could have went like that, right? Like kaboom. Um, and being able, whoever's listening, whether you're in Philly or whatever, reach out to those other community organizations, whether they're the same ethnic group or Asian as a whole or other ethnic backgrounds, come together, make decisions together as a community. Um, and the process is making sure that the list of demands are community-based, right? It was uh, over a dozen of us that sat together and had conversations about what do we need and what do we want. It was probably like a two hour meeting, uh, putting the, the four simple the four simple thing, uh, demands together uh, and holding on to it and making sure that the city the city knows that we want to hold you accountable to make these demands met. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I, I don't want to ramble too much because it's a hard question of how, how to heal. Um, but I know resources is one for sure. These demands are another. Working together is another one. And not making, and making sure that this story is not lost, right? Uh, we have, I have a spreadsheet of probably over a dozen news reporters that did the story on this, you know, whether it's print, uh, local news channels or online. Uh, we want to make sure that this is not forgotten and we utilize it somehow in the future as well. Yeah. Um, I think the, the count the, the, on the other side of healing, the worst thing that could happen is for nothing to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And for this to be swept under the rug, because mm -hmm. what message does that send? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Especially for the whole community, uh, API community, you know? Yep. Um, and I, I agree with you. Like, this, this needs to set a precedent. Because even when I think about the Atlanta shooting, mm -hmm. are all these, all these other people getting attacked, killed? Mm -hmm. I haven't heard any updates about ethnic intimidation, hate crime. Mm -hmm. um, 
And there's, I think there's a certain level of frustration within the API community of like, so you guys cover this, it goes viral, but nothing changes. We're not protected. So again, you know, I appreciate your bravery in the face of all this and persisting um, and hope we can support you in doing that in this long road. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, a lot of organizations have offered their support. Um, is there any type of support you feel like or any type of skill set that you ha you think would be very helpful at this stage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, during this entire process, so many uh, local nonprofits, small agencies, individuals even have reached out. And, and I think the most beautiful question that people have been asking was, how can we help you? Um, and that, that's great because, you know, that leaves they're not telling us what we need, right? So that's awesome. Um, but I do sometimes though revert back, especially if they're an organization or an agency like um, uh, that I'm not familiar with in terms of, I'm a, I'm a small nonprofit dude, right? I'm focused on programs and services, uh, and, you know, in our community. Um, so like when it comes to legality or, or, or even policy, things like that, you don't know what you don't know, right? That that's a term. Like, so I was reached out by a colleague of mine who who works in like um, uh, the legal field or or whatever the term you is, and I, I I informed her like I don't know what I don't know. So let's catch up. Let's talk. I'll update you on the situation, and you let me know what your perspectives are uh, and options, and you know things like that. And uh, another organization reached out, and I said the same thing. I don't know what I don't know. You know, I'm not an expert. Um, you know, I do advocacy, but I don't find myself as a social activist on the ground, like everyday, everyday organizing. Uh, I do different types of advocacy, right? So definitely Philly Solidarity, the work that you're doing, uh, the different community, the, the different membership that you have might have a really different perspective that will be helpful for us um, with that perspective, right? Um, so that, again, I don't know what I don't know, right? So I think that if you're an organization or individual who, who, who wants to support, um, definitely reach out, let us know. Um, at this point, we are uh, looking at trying to find resources, uh, especially in mental health and mental illness, um, to our community, because that's overall, as Asian API, specifically the Southeast Asian community, we, we don't have great access. We don't have enough um, understanding or doctors that can support our community, right? I've shared this before. There's no, like, really great term to even say the word, um, have someone who has mental illness, right? Um, uh, and there are two very, two very distinct mental illness terms, what, and they're not that great. Um, one, it, well, there's you know, the, the, the basic boil down to, or one, you're just crazy and nuts. And then two, someone put a magic spell on you and that's why you're messed up. And those two aren't, you know, you take this person to the temple to get blessed. And then this one, you're just nuts. They might just have to lock you up. Right. So there's the in-between that as a community, we're still trying to learn and figure out. Uh, we're grateful that Dr. Dr. Neri Kiff, uh, that's her field. She's Cambodian American, Philly raised. Uh, she, she and her organization Kiff is really, really, when CHV supporting them head on into, you know, the work that they're going to blossom and develop too. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess, and that's, that's pretty much it. I don't know what I don't know. And we do what we do, right? We're, we're, we're supporting our community as best as we can. Yep. Um, so I'll definitely connect and I'll hit you guys up and see if there's anything I can offer from the mental health standpoint, if it would be helpful. But obviously, um, you guys have great resources already. But I, I'd yeah. just like to extend that. You know, I think we have another conversation. Of course. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I would say the work that we do surrounding mental health is a lot of programs through our family support services. And it's not your traditional clinical, right? Right. So we, we are funded. We do get funding from DBH IDS, Department of Behavioral Health and Mental um, uh, Disability, uh, Intellectual Disability. And the thing is, the work that we do is, is so multi-layered with disparities that we're not only we're doing social services, but then we have programs that focuses on storytelling. So the storytelling component is that mental health component that helps them share. And then we have the part where, it, so it's all layered in. So... And I spoke with um, Escher from PCDC, right? right. Uh, she's amazing as well, um, Dr. Escher. And just figuring out as a community, I guess, that research side. We're doing the work, but we don't have that research or the clinical terms to back up 
what CAGP, CAGP has been doing for 40 years to make it look as legit because we are healing families the way we're doing it. We are healing families uh, with the way we're doing behavior health and mental health uh, programming and things like that. It's just not properly labeled, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say this. I mean, um, what you're doing is probably far more important than any clinical work I've ever done. Um, because at the end of the day, what mental health conditions cause is isolation and being alone, mm -hmm. and being away from the community. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is making sure the community has places mm -hmm. to be together. And that can be one of the most uh, under researched and underappreciated um, therapeutic things you can provide and you guys do it for all age ranges so like intuitively you guys know what you're doing um and hopefully that can be continued to be supported and then like you know clinical sure. things for the other things but i, I just want to say like from where i sit like this is community therapy which mm -hmm. you guys provide um so just just so some people understand because i think some people might un not understand like how this was traumatic for the community Right. It's like, well, look, an old lady wrote a letter like she doesn't have guns. Like, what's the big deal? Can you give us some examples of how it affected the community? Sure. So we, we have to take it back to the refugee camp is being pushed out of our country during the genocide, during the war, the civil war, uh, not having a home for, for years. Right being pushed from one refugee camp to the next refugee camp to the next refugee camp and then coming and arriving to America. Right. Uh, so not only my like the stories of Cambodian refugees is a sad one. The killing fields. You know, I'm 35 uh, and I was born in 1985. But majority of my family members on my dad's side died because of the war. I was born in a refugee camp myself, uh, as well as my 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 mother's side. A lot of them passed away from the war that were murdered and killed. Right. So the trauma of just death and, you know, war is there. Right. Whether you're a soldier or not, landmines, all that stuff. And then coming to America and being dropped down into un impoverished communities, uh, under under resourced communities, and you're told this is your new home, and the local community is not welcoming of you, right? Like now you're like, where is my home? It's been decades now, and then you're building a home, you're putting down your roots, you live in South Philadelphia. I was raised in South Philadelphia, right? You build a whole community on Seventh South Seventh Street. You hope to start building temples, but constantly you're still being pressured. You start. You just want to barbecue and sell food. You get pushed around by police officers during that time period. When 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 are you going to feel at home, right? Fast forward forty years in, you get a letter. <laughs> uh, you're just trying to celebrate Fourth of July and America. Well, you know, um, you know that holiday. <laughs> so you know, uh, and and you're just having fun. And again, you're targeted, and you're not allowed to celebrate, right? The triggering piece is that is not being not when are you able to find a home uh, using using war ter, war identity right as if to scare you right Americans are the reason why we're refugees right the bombing the Nixon bombings of um carpet bombings of uh, uh, Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War things like that you know uh, buying our own homes act as if we don't belong here is very triggering and our elders right our older adult and elders are constantly on survivor mode, right? They're, they're always on survivor mode. They're always hustling. If you visit the Southeast Asian market, that's in FDR Park right now, majority of them are elders. More, majority of the people in there are ref Cambodian refugee survivors. And they're still hustling, trying to survive, collecting as much pennies and dollar bills they can, right? Just to survive and, and to, to get that, this intimidation, it's, it's, it's saddening. Um, and, I, I hate to say it this way, during this whole anti-Asian hate process beyond the letter, uh, the intimidate, ethnic intimidation, there are a small group of elders or, or community members that says, just put your head down. It is our fault, right? They're accepting that hate. They're, they're, so other halves are not, right? They're like, no, this is wrong. But then there's the other group that are like, well, it is from, you know, they're agreeing that, you know what, it's, it is started up where it started out of. And they're like, you know, just stay home. Don't don't cause any trouble. Just protect yourself. And it's sad, you know, when you spend 60, 70, 80 years of your life being quiet and hiding and hiding in the jungles, not stepping on landmines, to tippy towing around the neighborhood you're supposed to call home in Philly, to now avoiding going outside so that you don't get beat because you're you're blaming yourself. 
when are you able just to breathe and live your life without stressing about your grandchild right, living in their life? I know I'm going to a rambling rant. It's all mixed in, right? It's all together. Uh, and that's, that's what's triggering. And this is a prime time of whether or not we accept this and be quiet, right, about this letter, about this, oh, it's just a letter. It's not just a letter. It's symbolic. This letter is symbolic. And how we address this letter, it can overpower and overshadow an entire Cambodian community or the Asian community. Or we can, like, really, really fight, you know, like, struggle, like, really bring it to light. Uh, and that's the key piece where people who don't understand this type of work won't relate these two things of refugees and coming to America to this one single letter. This single letter, this single letter that supposedly was written by this one person did all this chaos. This one single person who typed up the letter that was probably laughing with a group of people in the kitchen while they're putting it together, assuming, didn't realize they were unraveling 40 years of work by the Cambodian Association, 40 years of work. That it was just, a, you know, whatever they're in their minds are, it's just messed up, you know? And it's more than that, it's chaos, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think you're rambling. I think it's, it, it's important for everyone to hear exactly how this is affecting the people who are living in the community. Because um, I think it's easy to use generic terms, um, reactivating PTSD and triggering, and like these are educational terms. But I think a lot of times people rather use that term than to actually go through the emotional work to talk about, look, man, like our elderly, they, they lived in jungles and avoided mines, and now they're hearing about war veterans using their guns. They're hiding in their houses, telling their children to hide in the house. They're not going to the park anymore. They're afraid going back to work just to make money, but that's the only thing they know how to do. So, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and I think this is why, and these are maybe the stories that people need to hear for them to take this seriously as a hate crime or ethnic intimidation, because um, it's easy to say, oh, you know, she, they didn't intend it. They just wanted the fireworks to stop. It wasn't their intention. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the definition of a hate crime I have a problem with mm -hmm. to begin with, because like at the end of the day, it's not about the intention. It's about the impact on the community. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. Exactly. And, and I want to, you know, we need to change that. Um, mm -hmm. It should start with the community. And all the conversations and the press and the police and the politicians, they need to start talking about the community and we can worry about the, the feelings of the perpetrator mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I wanted to uh, highlight the four demands you guys had um, because I think it was very well done. And, you know, I'll, I'll read it if that's okay. And you can elaborate kind of one by one just to sure. see what that'll look like and how we can support. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to say I pinned the, um, your website and your services just so everyone to see how amazing you guys are. Um, the Cambodia well, Association. The, the old website. <laughs> Sorry about the website. What, what, what's, what's the new if website? Any, no, well, well, I'm still building it. But okay. if I didn't pin the Facebook, because that's the, uh, the website's a little sad. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, I'll take that in a second. But um you guys do amazing services people need to know about you guys and people need to support you guys whether it's donating visiting the website um whether it's just supporting the community in general going down to the fdi park supporting the food markets there um and also just paying attention to this story and if if it feels like the right attention is not given to this story and people want to sweep it under the rug like join in with us make your voice louder if we need to, if we need to do a rally, we need to do a rally, right? If it, if it, if it comes. Oh to yeah, that. for sure. You know, like, and that's the thing. Like, we want to. We're waiting for this investigation to get done. We're waiting to get updates from the DA's office. Um, and the the next steps, we definitely want to make sure our community knows for sure. Yeah. So the four demands you guys have: accountability of the individual who sent the threatening letter for the impact of their violent language impersonation of a veteran, and weaponization of mental health. This includes a full and transparent investigation that is centered around the community impacted. 
do you have anything to, to say about that or what that would look like in terms of accountability? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, we, we thought of different scenarios, right, um, of who this individual could have been or is um, and different perspectives. For uh, I would say there's many options, but I'll share one option. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> right? Maybe I shouldn't. Um, but okay. just because just because we don't want to, you know, whatever. Yeah. But let's just say that if this person is not charged, there still needs to be some form of accountability and apology and acknowledgement that this person needs to do some sort of service coming to our community and connecting and things like that. We, we don't know how that all looks like. I still want to communicate with our community leadership and our community members and, and things like that. But either way, this person needs to be held accountable because they did the damage. The damage was done, period, right? No matter who, what, where, where, you know, who she is or, you know, whatever. Um, and the transparent investigation, we really want to know what they found at the very end because so far the only information we were given, I'll be really open about that. They just informed us that the person's 79 and it's a woman. And it's been two and a half weeks now, right? But that's the only thing we knew from uh, Philly PD. Uh, we're still waiting for more information. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I want to say it's already damaging enough that they weaponize mental health and, mm -hmm. you know, um, further the stigma that maybe people with mental health or PTSD are yeah. more dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, it's already damaging enough that they're mm -hmm. impersonating veterans. Exactly. But to write a letter and threaten with guns a specific community, I cannot imagine how that is not a crime. Exactly. You know, I can't, yeah. I, and if it isn't a crime, it needs to be a crime. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we will be uh, eagerly awaiting the results of all this. For sure. And, you know, and I'm not saying 80-year-old people don't know how to use a computer, but... <laughs> Again, the way it was processed, it was very pretty tech savvy. So just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh we've seen already how how um how seventy year old people in, in power can cause a lot of damage mm -hmm. and hurt. So oh, yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think age is an exclusion sure. for crimes. Mm -hmm. Um but that's a separate conversation. Um cool. So your second demand is collaborative collaboratively work with city agencies, officials and local organizations to create more equitable accessibility to mental health resources and communication. Mm -hmm. um, anything to say or what would that look like? Yeah, for sure. You know, we're working closely with the, the mayor's commission and we want to make sure DBIDS is there, uh, the um, uh, Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, just making sure that, you know, it, it, it's important that they understand that what is, and this is an ongoing conversation for over two decades. It's the same repeated, repetitive Mm -hmm. conversation and just making sure that uh, those those resources are coming to our communities right uh, culturally competent right uh, working with local CBOs not just hey we offer these things send your people you know that's that's what happens right hey we have an outreach worker who's not your that doesn't look like your community um, we want to really connect and when you connect hey these is a handout these are the things we do bring them over you know what I mean it's like there's a disconnect there you know, we need to work together. We need to make sure it all makes sense. Not one one method may work for this community, but it may not work for this community, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the well, choir. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, so you know what I mean. Um, but, yeah, so that's what we want to make sure that's uh, accessible, uh, culturally competent, sensitive, all that stuff uh, with the city level, uh, with official, local uh, uh, officials, elected officials as well. Uh, to, to bring those resources to connect it. You know, we don't want to hear resources are limited. Well, they're limited, but the general broad brushstrokes aren't, aren't, aren't painting our community, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I do want to say this because this is a professional interest of mine mm -hmm. about access to mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, and also kind of what I've learned in doing some of this activism work is it's important to bring the resources to where the people are at when they're marginalized mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it would be nice if the city and organizations with resources would stop expecting marginalized and traumatized communities mm -hmm. to access resources that are wherever the hell, yes, right? yes. convenient for you. Exactly. You have the resources and funds and the model of healthcare should be less about access and more about delivery. Mm -hmm. right why don't you deliver these resources to you guys 
Mm-hmm. So um, I know that people, uh, I've because I've had these conversations in other settings, um, they like to uh, pretend like that's just not possible and it's too much work, but mm-hmm. it is your job to figure out what works. Mm-hmm. So I would say let's let's deliver instead of worry about them accessing. Mm-hmm. Um, so demand number three is prioritization of this community in regards to investment of resources, for example, funding and grant opportunities that specifically builds capacity within the community by the community. Mm-hmm. Um, Want to share, talk more about that? Yeah, total. You know, a lot of these, um, whether it's mental health or, or any type of programming, uh, again, it's, you know, it's, there. I, maybe it's a me thing. <laughs> I find problems when they, 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 they tweet best practices sometimes or curriculum that work. You know, again, it's it's particular to certain communities from certain cities or certain states or certain rural or urban communities from other cities, right? Um, so in regards to our specific Philadelphia, Southeast Asian, Cambodian American experience here, grow a program of what 40 years of work looks like with your expertise, as our expertise, with your expertise, and let's make a, new, a program that makes the most sense, right? It's not like, we're not starting from scratch here, right? So in terms of um, uh, uh, of investing resources to the community, whether it's grant-funded, human resources, you know, human resources of humans come together and build something together, right? I know the DA, he, you know, he was the first to say that he actually had, I don't know if you knew this, I didn't know this, they apparently have a million dollars of drug money. I'm probably saying it the wrong way, but uh, <laughs> that's how I interpret it. They got a million dollars of drug money every year where they would distribute it back to communities to utilize for community programming. And he urged us at that meeting for us to apply for it, uh, to, to, to apply for it so that we can, that's the first offer that he already exists. So I, I'm glad that he brought it up because I never knew that. Did you know that existed? Nope. Yeah, a million bucks every year, and so far the this fiscal, I believe this fiscal year, uh, they already gave out two hundred thousand, so they have about eight hundred thousand left. Uh, he said the focus is around kind of like youth, uh, young adults. Um, so you know that's great, um, but we want to also make sure that uh, uh, Dr. Neri Kith and her organization can also access it, even though they work with a lot of our elders uh, and community, uh, and then Lanika works with. Uh, so, um, arts and justice in that sense in our organization we do we, we have a nice fit but how can we all access it together so that we hit our entire community in a 360 perspective right um but yeah yeah so those those conversations and building things from the ground up uh with with current expertise is is, is a is a is a genuine goal that we want to have mm-hmm. yeah well i mean i think you guys deserve to receive that grant money given your excellent track record about how you guys are actually delivering what the community wants and needs. So um, I hope you guys get the the resources and not just money. Um, mm. to... Kind of strange we got to call it drug money, though, though. Yeah, well. Mm. It's <laughs> money, though. It's, it is, it is. Yeah. Um, and the last demand is we call for institutional and systems-wide anti-racist and equity-building training and implementation from the city level because we recognize the impact of these larger institutions on BIPOC communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as an entire group, we understood that this isn't just a, a resource need for just the Cambodian community. You know, we were raised in in BIPOC communities, you know what I mean? That we saw our neighbors, whether they're Black or Latinx, that they, they weren't receiving those resources and the services. Uh, and a lot of these issues are from the top up, right? Uh, systematically and things like that. So when we're talking about training and things like that, we just want to make sure that they have a better understanding how to work with our community. You know, in the 90s, for example, uh, Narin, you know, he's amazing um, uh, explaining these pieces because I grew up in South Philly as well. And the Cambodian community, we had a huge gang issue in South Philadelphia, right? The Crips, uh, uh, Blood, TRG, uh, and that's focused a little heavy on our young adults and youth that during that time period. And that's connected with, uh, uh, you know, and that it's connected to our pipeline of the deportation that we're having now. You know, all these things are, are needs to be addressed because in the end, we're during this incident, during this attack in our community, being told to work with Philly PD and having that trust issue relationship. You know, there's there's training that that's all all around, right? Um, and 
we just want to make sure all community members and our the, the communities we raised in gain access um, institutionally and funding and all that. It's it's getting late. <laughs> I'm like on oh, my random my ramble mood, but like you know, so definitely not not making it a separate issue from the Cambodian community. We want to include our BIPOC community as a whole. And uh, I don't know if you know this. Uh, you know, our off our main office is in North Philadelphia. Uh, majority of our community, when we first arrived in Philadelphia, were from North Philadelphia. A lot of our families are actually still up there. You know, and our our uh, our office is actually on a predominantly Black, Caribbean, African immigrant business corridor. You know, and they need resources as well. Our entire immigrant community, BIPOC community, needs support. Uh, especially around mental health and, and all this other all the, all these other key resources, and I feel like it's a um, a broken record. Someone new get reelected, we gotta repeat it. A new council mm. person, we say it. Uh, I've been doing this work for about fifteen years. Every time there's a new um, example, a new um, damn, what the hell do they call them? Uh, the head of the school district. Oh, I can't remember. Superintendent. Uh, yeah, superintendent. Yeah, I'm not one for titles, but yeah. So the superintendent. Every time there's a new one, we have to have a meeting. Um, we're re-educating them. Same thing with the elected officials. It's over and over again. So we always constantly feel like we're restarting, we're restarting, we're restarting. To change that, it needs to be systematic change. The hot topic word for the last five, six, seven years is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Oh, now like every single department in the city, every single corporation that has a DEI office, what the fuck does that really mean? You know what I mean? Is it a checklist for them? It needs some sort of systematic change up top down. Put the money where it needs to be. Do proper training. That's just to boil it down without me rambling too much. <laughs> so yeah. I want to end with this. Um, and um, this is what I hope is most helpful for everyone else. For like a common person who's tuning in who wants to support the Cambodian community mm -hmm. right now, um, mm -hmm. what would you say is the uh, few good ways they can help support you guys? Um, you know, those who know me knows I will always bring up, and it's a broken record for me, is the segregated data. Remember, always know that the API community, we all have different contrasting needs. We have contrasting stories. We do have similar stories. But for the Cambodian Association, you know, the segregated data is definitely key and important. Understanding the data, understanding where each of our Asian American communities come from. Uh, and I would say that for the Cambodian Association, we are a minority within a minority. Sure, we've been working for 40 years hard, one of the oldest, one of the oldest API organizations, yet you could run into an Asian person who doesn't even know we exist or didn't realize how much big the Cambodian community is, you know, and then you think, oh, was, were we doing enough to inform the city and these people as a whole of who we are, right? But at the end of the day, if you want to help us, literally visit our community hubs, learn more about us, visit the Southeast Asian market in FDR Park. It grew from the 90s with f just five Cambodian and uh, about five different Cambodian and Laotian vendors. Now it's just blossomed to this huge Southeast Asian to include Indonesian, Vietnamese, uh, Thai, uh, community members as well, pumping more support to our community and identifying that, hey, I might be Chinese American, but these are Southeast Asians and celebrate our, our identity as well uh, together, right? And then there's South 7th Street, there's uh, South 7th Street is unofficial Cambodia town. There's so many long-term businesses that's been there from the 90s. Restaurants, tailor shops, all these things you could explore right here in South Philadelphia. And a lot of people still don't know about that. Uh, and I, so the, I, I might be breaking away from the Cambodian. This is how you can help CAGP. But that's how you help the entire community, actually exploring other communities, right? Uh, across the street on the other side of broad is the Indonesian community. There's so many restaurants there. To make our... And to make our, uh, in Khmer we call it Sikum, to make our Sikum strong is to be able to understand where you come from and our community. And as an API, Asian American community, we need to visit each other and understand each other, right? We're not the other, we're the same in this, this Philadelphia historic story. So celebrate us and celebrate yourselves as well. That's the key thing, celebrate all API. You know, and that, when I say PI, I feel some type of way too. Because are we really doing justice to the Pacific Islander community by keep saying API, right? I can't even think of it, you know what I mean, how we've done that for that community. So with the Asian American community, sure, you know. So being conscious, know your intent. And when we say Asian American, just celebrate the minorities and the minorities, everyone to bring visibly, amplify our, our voice, amplify our visibility as a whole. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Sarun, I want to end by thanking you um, for your bravery um, and for re going through this trauma that you guys have been enduring for the past few weeks and will continue to be addressing moving forward. So, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and your trauma. Um, and we'll be in touch and we wish you the best. Thank you, Philly Solidarity. Thank you, Hing. <laughs> uh, and thank you, everybody who's reached out, supported us. Uh, and I'm glad that you, your, your organization was formed. It's less than a year old, right? Yeah, it's like four months no. old. Yeah, so we have four a lot months old. It's four months old. You came, you jumped in with a splash. I know that we, you know, that's hard to do to gain, you know, to be able to, to, to connect with all these other API organizations in our city and, and embrace and, and things like that. So I really greatly appreciate that. Um, so other than that, thank you. And I'm, I hope to work with y'all some more, uh, all the people in the, I guess the chat thing going on, uh, feel free to connect um, uh, and celebrate our Philly identity. You know, we're Philly Asian Americans, we're Philly Philadelphians, just keep living your life and, you know, have some sass. Yeah. Let's let's be brave and be proud together. Yeah, totally. Take care, Sarun. All right, bye. Bye.